Alright, it's uh, officially 3.15, so let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is the, literally the last session of the last day of the conference. And I know you guys are tired, and, um, and I know some of you might have wanted to get like a head start uh, going home or wherever you need to be, so I appreciate you guys staying to the very end. Um, today we're going to talk about build specs. It's a topic that I feel very passionate about. You guys will see why in a second. Uh, but um, before we get started, talk to you a little bit about who I am. Um, like I said, my name is Rolando Scott. I'm a passionate, performance-driven web developer uh, that has been in the Drupal sphere for the last 15 years. Um, those are a lot of fancy words just to say that I've worn many hats and have been in different places doing very different things. Uh, right now, I'm the director of Drupal development at Teori, which is an agency in Washington, D.C. Um, I oversee anywhere between 25 and 30 developers. We do Drupal, we do WordPress, and I oversee the teams and the managers that oversee them. Um, so, um, oh, and I'm, I'm from Costa Rica. I work out of Costa Rica. Uh, if you guys ever want to come to Costa Rica, feel free to ask me. I'll be more than happy to show you where you guys should go. Um, before we actually get started, I do want to see a show of hands. Um, who here actually knows what a build spec is, right? It's hands, hands, about half. Um, in your organization or in your agency, do you guys use some sort of variation of a build spec before you start on a website? Show of hands, yes, yes. Everybody, they just throw, okay. I'm kind of scared I'm not seeing as many because <laughs> that means half of you just go into a website just like oh website let's go and, and without planning a lot and you know that that unfortunately is something that does happen um, and for those who do use a build spec in some sort is it an internal tool that you guys used or uh, created I'm sorry or do you use somebody else's uh, tool you know, internal most of the time yeah internal. all right cool that's good. All right, so let's start with a definition. Uh, what's a build spec, right? So in its simplest form, a build spec is a tool that allows an organization, an agency, anybody that's building a website uh, to define how they're gonna build the website and how they're gonna fulfill the requirements for that particular project, right? That is the basic of what a build spec tool is. But in reality, it's a lot more than that, right? It's something that forces developers to work in the same way, right? Um, in a simple to understand example, for example, uh, in, in the Drupal example, I'm sorry. Um, if my agency uses paragraphs and I define that my components are paragraphs, I don't want to see a developer using some other form of, of repeatable blocks, right? I don't want them to, uh, using layout blocks or anything like that, right? I, I'm going to specify that I, you need paragraphs, so that's what I'm hoping. So this tool allows me to force developers to work on the same approach. It also gives me flexibility, right, to offboard and onboard developers because the plan is already in place. So the next developer that comes in just needs to follow the plan. Uh, please note that it's um, less problematic <laughs> And it, right, it's not a magical silver bullet, but it, it helps. Um, it allows internal teams to easily create workflows, and we'll talk about those in a second, on what happens when I create the build spec, what happens after I do it, um, and how to QA. And it also allows developers to not waste time thinking on how to name things. <laughs> it, it sounds bizarre, but naming things is hard, right? And you have, I don't, well, maybe you do have, but, um, Developers spend a lot, a lot of time just thinking how they're going to name a component. And if you have two developers working on two different parts of the site, and this isn't defined, one of them might take a, an approach and say, like, oh, you know, we have some grid columns here, so I'll just call this component grid columns. Okay. And then this other developer is working on another component, and he says, oh, this is actually catered to events, so I'll just call this event listing. It turns out that they're not the same type of name, right? One is being very general, one is being very specific. Um, there's not a right or wrong, but maybe it would be better, especially for the client and the admin experience, if all the names of the components and the content types and all the other entities have one way of thinking, right? It'll be better uh, admin experience. So that's part of what a build spec brings, right? Um, why do I feel so passionate about build specs? <laughs> Uh, 
I have a story to tell you guys. Uh, when I started at Teori, I was a developer, a tech leader of sorts, um, and I quickly learned that um, the project you were working on depended a lot, the, the process on it depended a lot on who the other developers were, who the project manager was, and the approach that they took, right? So we had one sort of a spreadsheet that kind of rolled around. <coughs> um, the problem with that spreadsheet is that it was an open-ended spreadsheet, right? You could write whatever your heart desired on it. Um, and so on one project, it was catered one way. On another project, it was catered another way. Um, decisions were made during the design process that came from even the sales process of like, okay, I sold you a website. You have 10 content types, right? Um, but what is a content type? Like, is a listing page a content type? Is every individual listing page, like if you have events, you have blogs, are those two content types or two different content types? Those decisions were made by the designers and the project manager. And I can't tell you, you know, maybe that's a little bit less than ideal, right? Because they are not gonna build out the site. So I would, I would see these things and I would say, wait, wait, why are we charging the client for two different content types? Um, when they're actually the same content type, they just have a different listing, right? Or it's, it's just the same listing that has a different taxonomy filter or whatever, right? Those type of decisions could only be made by the developer, right? So I, I think it didn't fit right in my mind. And then one day, <laughs> I was working on a site and the PM gave me the build spec and they were like, okay, here, and for this content type, you need to do a picky field. And I was like, <laughs> I'm sorry, what? And she was like, yeah, picky field. And I'm like, I'm sorry, is there some sort of like language thing that I'm not getting? Like, what is a picky field? And she's like, yeah, you know, the ones you click on and then you pick the option. And I was like, okay, all right, this is, I'm, I'm good. They're like, I can't do this, right? So, so obviously you're talking about a select field, right? That is, and I showed her and she's like, oh yeah, I've just always called it picky and whatever. I'm like, okay. All right, we need one single language. We need one way of doing this. Um, and we needed to do something about it because every single website that our agency had was super different. Uh, I talked to my immediate manager, uh, she is here, uh, thankfully. Uh, she said it was a great idea. Uh, unfortunately, we went up a little bit up the ladder and they said it wasn't that great of an idea. Uh, one of the things I was just talking to somebody is that sometimes this is lost in the mix. Uh, when you're looking at a postmortem, when you're analyzing a website, uh, like, oh, where did we go wrong? Sometimes uh, CEOs or C-level people or other people outside of development don't understand how important this step is. And so they're like, well, maybe this doesn't matter. Like, uh, you took too long building. Okay, I took too long building, but why? Like, why, right? Maybe it's because we didn't define this. So the answer was no, and I went ahead and did it anyways, and yes, I got chewed out, but to this day, um, the, the system that we use at Teori was the one that I built out and uh, ended up being right, and thankfully I had a supportive manager that um, didn't fire me. <laughs> I didn't shoot him out for the record. No, yeah, you didn't. Fire me. I did definitely I get you got out. chewed out for it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's, that's the story, right? That was, after that picky field, I was just like, nope, it's, it's over, we need something different, right? So in the objectives of this build spec, right? Um, what did I wanna do? I wanted to make sure that one person, one entity, somebody, was in charge of specifying names, fields, functionality, and requirements of all the sections. And components of the part and parts of the site. So, for example, again, we use paragraphs a lot. So, paragraphs, layout blocks, content types. What are the fields that these have? Uh, what is the functionality that's ex expected of them? Are the display modes of each content type? Um, it should also enumerate all the rest of the components, like menus, taxonomy, image style, web forms, and user. That says rules, but it should be roles. <laughs> Um, describe additional requirements the projects needs, right? Oh, it has an SSO, a single sign-on, it needs an, an API endpoint, something, right? And it should specify the views and listings and everything else. Um, but overall, the main objective of having a build spec is to have the something that the client signs off on. That's the main thing, that's the key. That is something where you can go back and tell the client, hey, I know you've seen the wireframes, I know you've seen the design, I know we've been talking about this project for the last four or five, six months, but here is what your website's actually gonna look like. And here's where you can sign that you accept that. Because in theory, right, 
gone are the days of clients being clients and scope creep is gone in theory. Right? At least you have something to fall back on, right? So <laughs> the main advantages of having a build spec is that it creates opportunities for internal workflows for project managers and designers and other areas. I'll get into this a little bit more. Um, it allows project managers to easily go back to clients and get paid change orders or negotiate changes, right? That is one of the biggest wins the build spec has given us. Uh, when a client comes back and says, well, actually, I wanted this purple, and when I said green, I actually meant purple, and you should have known that. And um, the, um, the project manager can go back in and say, sure, we could do this purple, but um, here's you know a, an hour of labor to, to do this because you had already a, a approved and agreed that this was going to be green. This tool is a lot better than just having the project manager go come back and say like, oh, well, I think we hadn't talked about, right, and maybe decided. So we have seen a massive increase in, in uh, paid change orders with clients just thanks to this tool. Um, another advantage is that it, make, it makes creating the development tickets or tasks very easy and straightforward. If I already have the whole site planned out, then when I'm creating tickets in Jira, and Teamwork, whatever project, uh, project management system that you use, I literally just have to copy. And that, I don't even have to copy, I can just reference the, the build spec uh, line, right? I can say like, oh, uh, here's, I have to create this content type, here you go, there's a task, sign it to somebody. Go from there, um, and it gives everybody in the project a single source of truth. Now there's not a thing where like, oh, Rolando, you have said that I wanted to do this, but I actually wanted to do this other way. No, no, we can have a discussion, but the single source of truth is the build spec, right? That's what should be built. Um, and then also, if you have a design system or some sort of repeatable component in your organization, it's super easy to reference that and make sure that that gets done. At Teodi, at the beginning, we have a sort of system that's called repeat, where we have like a call to action and certain like two column text and stuff like that that we use on every single site. Uh, sometimes designers would use that and not tell us, so when we were building out the site, the developer didn't know that if they had to use one of the repeatable components or create it from scratch. So without it's just loss and efficiencies, right, of, of just creating something that already existed in our organization, right? So the build spec helped with that. Let's talk about those workflows and responsibilities, right? So the way we have it set up is the developers are in charge of the build spec. It's the tech leads, the architect, whoever's in charge of the website from the development side, uh, responsibility to create all of it. And I know when I talk to developers, to developers about this, I can already hear like the groans, right? I can already hear like, oh my God, it's a lot of work. Yes. It is, but that's on purpose. It's, it's on purpose because you as a tech lead, it's your responsibility to know all the site. You have to know exactly what you're building. You need to know all the requirements, all the things. So this forces you to. I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not telling anybody uh, something new, but in an agency where you're pressured and you're doing a bunch of things at once, um, it's easy to start a project and not really understand it until you're like really deep in it, right? So having a build spec forces the tech lead to look into it and have to document basically the whole website. Um, another key role that we, or another key uh, workflow that we have is developers don't start on the build spec until the design isn't fully finalized because that's an easy thing to get wrong and that causes a lot of issues. I'm sure again, you guys have all heard of designers kind of finished with the design but not really and then there being additional pressure to start development with half-baked designs that causes issues because developers make assumptions and then designers come in and that assumption was wrong, right? Or another thing, like we have the desktop designs but the mobile designs will come later, right? Mm -hmm. That is something very typical. We don't allow that anymore. We won't start building, t touching, or even creating the build spec until designs aren't fully finalized. It just forces the project managers to be on top of the designers and have a fully uh, agreed upon design before we start the build spec. And then the last part is the most important part is that developers don't start coding or building the site until the build spec isn't approved and signed off by the client. So you are forcing the client to say, yes, this is the website that you're going to build me. I am approving it. By that time, designs are all finalized. Everything is finalized and ready to go. This is the most important thing because before the client signs off, that means the designer looked at the site, right, and signed off and said, like, yes, this, this looks like the design that I, that I provided. 
And the PM can also look at it and say, like, yes, this is exactly all the requirements and everything the client is expecting, right? So you have the whole team working together to make sure that what is presented to the client is what the client wants and is we're all in the same um, headspace of what we're going to end up building for the client. So those three things are super important in the way how we handle this. Um, some disadvantages, right? Um, client might feel that creating a build spec and putting so much attention and time to it stops the progress or flow of the website, right? Um, I don't know if it's happened to you guys, but when clients start a website during discovery and all those, uh, they're very excited, they're, there's a lot going on, there's surveys, there's all these things, and then wireframes come up, and then we have designs, and by the time designs come in, it's been a couple of months, and the client's like ready to go, they're probably <coughs> feeling the pressure on their end to get a website out, right? So, yes, okay, well, great, we have designs. Uh, when do I start seeing the website? Oh, wait, you have to do a build spec? Great, but that isn't the website. Like, what, what's going on? So yes, it's uh, for some clients, it's a little bit hard to understand why we dedicate so much time to this. And you know, it's one of those things where you kind of have to sit the client down and then say, like, we're spending time now to not have to spend the time later, right? We're being efficient now, so we're not being inefficient later. Uh, a good amount of hours are needed to be invested by developers without having anything code or a visible website to show for it, right? So that's that's the other part, right? Developers that don't understand or don't think this concept is as important, they'll be grumpy. Like you have a tech lead uh, have working, you know, depending on the size of the site, we're talking about eight, 10, 12 hours, you know, a couple of days of, of working on a website without actually coding anything, right? And that sounds kind of crazy. Right, and then um, sometimes those same developers will feel that it doubles up the work because we'll, we'll see it in a second where if I am specifying that a content type exists and it has this field, the summary field, and then it has this title, and it has, I don't know, a, a date title and all that, once that's approved, I need to go back into Drupal and do exactly the same thing, right? I need to create a content type that creates this field and does this thing. And so it, it sometimes feels like, why am I doing things twice, right? Why, do I, why do I, don't I just build it and then have the client approve it, right? So that is one of the disadvantages or the, the friction points, right? Um, the thing that you need to kind of let the developers understand, especially developers that may, or may not be as experienced or may have not lived through um, difficult situations is that it's worth it. It's definitely worth it because once, yes, to a point, you're kind of repeating yourself, but you're sure. You're sure. There's like, at this point, everything's approved, so while you're building this content type, no one's going to come back and say like, oh no, this needs to be different, right? So, um, let's look at a, a real world example, right? And I can show you what I actually ended up building and why it works for us and it might work for something uh, for an agency like yours or an organization like yours. Um, let me see if I can do this. Yes. So this is a website we did a couple years ago for EDF uh, Fishery Solution Center uh, at Teody. It's a pretty nice website. Um, it has sections. It has all what you would expect from the site. This is an XD file, right? This is a design file. There's comments by our designer. There's comments by the client. All that is good feedback. All of this is very normal, right? Um, and this is how it looks in the build spec tool that I built out. So at the beginning of the uh, build spec, we see a header, right? We know there's a status, which I'll talk about in a second, some important links uh, that I need developers to, uh, to have access to, you know, where the project lives and teamwork, the wireframe design, slick plan, and some of the team roles. Um, and then we go after the actual components, right? So. Let's talk about, okay, we had a homepage content type, right? So there's some um, comments in here. I have the fields. I have if it's a single, if I can repeat it, if this is required, some comments, some help text, etc. To me, one of the most important parts of this is how I marry the visual part of it to the technical part of it. Because that helps clients and developers understand yeah, um, what we're talking about. Sometimes when you do the Excel file uh, solution, 
you know, clients, like you're talking about something and it's hard for the client to comprehend, right? They don't do this every day, what you're actually talking about, right? But here it isn't, like, oh, okay, so a title, sure, okay, this is a title. And then we have a featured image that is going to be the background, great. And then hero title, et cetera, right? And like you start looking at the fields and they all make sense, right? And you could actually do a little bit of a better job and almost say like, oh, feature tools title, okay, so it's this one, right? And, and help coach the client on what exactly it is, right? So these are content types. You can see you have them all in there with the design. And then we have the other components, uh, like paragraphs, right? So we have the text log, quotes, yada yada, all the components and everything. Uh, even some instructions, some additional things, etc. And then on uh, the same vein, you know, we have menus. Um, we have taxonomy, we have views, image styles, mail blocks, forms, rules, and uh, general requirements. Uh, so, okay, so, you know, we know a form needs to have CAPTCHA. We know that this is going to be a multilingual site, but um, it's using G Translate, so not really a multilingual site. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, Google Analytics is going to use Yoast, it's going to use Social Share, Search, blah, 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 send grid to send emails, blah, blah, blah. All of this in one central location. And at the end, what I can do is I can click on export, and this generates a PDF file, which is ultimately what the client ends up signing off on. So you send them this as a deliverable, client signs this off. And the good thing about this is that um, it's not just for new projects. If you're doing a new feature that is somewhat complex, that somehow you know it's going to create new content types and new functionality, you can use this as well. You can use this as well. It doesn't have to be a whole new big site. Um, anything that's a little bit more complicated than just add a couple of fields or whatever, you can use something like this, right? Um, and this is just one of many that we have in our listings. This is one central place where all of this lives. And, uh, and yeah, so this was great. We, it took a lot of work to get us here. It, uh, this isn't easy. And you know, over the time, we started adding new features. Uh, for example, I don't think it's present on this one, but if I go and edit this content type, for example, I now have a field to put the estimations on. Uh, because we added a functionality, see, so um, the idea is to be efficient. Now I can grab this. If you if you guys see that it says this export is for the PDF, but I can actually generate a task list that goes into Teamwork, which is a project management system that we use, um, that generates all the tasks in the CSV file. So I go into a project, I upload that CSV file, boom, all the tasks are created. Now I just have to assign them to whoever needs to be assigned. Um, so we added a couple fields of, of um, estimation. Um, so the tasks that get automatically created already have an estimate on them. So I can say like, oh yeah, I don't know, back end is gonna take 10 hours, and then the front end is gonna take uh, five, and then bam. And you guys can see the system that's in here to create the fields. If this looks very drupal -y, it's because this is Drupal. This is a Drupal site. Uh, which uh, gives us a bunch of advan advantages, right? First of all, we know Drupal and we can customize this however we want. And also, our, our own developers, if they ever have a little bit of downtime or they need to you know, figure out what they do, they can work on this. They can add new features to this. And, and this is ours, right? This is a Drupal site. This is ours that we control. So even, you know, we incorporated even field groups to, to get it to work how Drupal groups the fields, but you can add fields just like this. Um, and then again you can say it's limited or unlimited if, it, if it's limited you can put in how many um, very uh, instances of the field that you want and then you can add all this right so for example I select the text field uh, I want it to be a short text field and just plain right and not WYSIWYG and so on and so on and that's how we go in and create all of this uh, that gets us this build spec. So, like I said, uh, in a site this size, uh, we're talking about 10, 12 hours, um, it's worked very well. 
Um, it's a long way from picky fields and Excel files. <laughs> and uh, I really can't show you the full listing because it has all of our clients there, but um, I can, you know, this is just one of the nodes that exist and the full listing of all of our clients and all of our work. Um, one thing that we're doing now, um, oh, to try to mitigate some of the issues is um, this. So this is a new version of this that goes uh, that goes further than what this other one did. This is something that I was working on. I've been working on the main thing, and, and it, you know, it's called developer dashboard because it includes other things for developers. But in the build spec part, um, it has this awesome functionality, right? That if I go ahead and create the content types and everything else that I need. At some point, I have this magical button that says mm -hmm. export configurations, right? And that should work. Maybe it doesn't. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So maybe locally. All right. Sorry about that. Uh, well, imagine that this actually generates a download with a configuration that you can add to a brand new site run it, import it, and then you have all the content types, all the paragraphs, everything built out. With the main advantages of that is, apart from having an instant site, is that now front end is ready to go because all the content types and everything is built out. And back end can actually focus on complicated things. Uh, I can actually, you know, site building is out of the way, and so I can actually start creating that custom module that does that API connection and blah, 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 blah all that. You can have both teams working right away after you finish this. Um, yeah, so I don't know, do we have any questions or doubts? Oh, <laughs> uh, sure. Yeah, is this an um, internal tool? Yes, this is so, so yes, this is an internal tool that's been done uh, for Teori. I, on the outside, am working on something, uh, and we're not, let me, uh, I am working on creating this as a SaaS product. Uh, on my own, um, it's, it's definitely. Not, it's not a Drupal guy. It it isn't no. Um, but um, yeah. Um, so my oh, I think it's frozen. It's probably in my computer. So I, I'm working on a product. Uh, my idea is that it's a SaaS, but it'll have a free uh, type tier. Um, so if you want to build something on your own, if you're a small agency that works for you, if you're a big corporate agency, then um, yes, you can definitely, we can talk about it and figure out how this works. But yes, um, that's part of my, what I'm trying to build out um, in the next few months. Yes. A comment and question. Yes. This is also good for QA. Yes. The QA runs smoother. Exactly. And for the customer who says, oh, I know we talked about this last August. You know, it's not in writing, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so we do something similar. The difference is we and our staff, we have an information architect. Sure. So the information <coughs> architect does most of the decisions about content type mm -hmm. and the fields in it. Sure. Um, put a developer with them so that the picky field, or in their case, it was a field group that really meant a paragraph sure. component, mm -hmm. go together. But how do you feel about the information architect doing most of the build spec in that sense. Sure. Um, I think they can have valuable input because they're with the client at that uh, specific stage um, and they can kind of direct certain things. They can make sure that, I don't know, uh, the menu is going to work in a certain way, right? That it's going to be structured in a way, uh, breadcrumbs, etc. And all that's fine. All that's fine, but the person involved of actually putting in this menu that they thought of should be the developer, right? So they can make all the decisions. We're not necessarily, well, in, in those cases for content related things and I related things. Um, but it, it's still important that the developer first understands it and the developer is the one that puts it in. Because here, well, we're talking about a very simple menu, but like if we're talking about a mega menu, for example, as a developer, I need to understand how that's going to work, where the blocks of my information are going to come from, and then I need to look at the mobile menu 
and see if this actually fits in here, or am I going to have to generate two different menus, one for desktop, one for mobile? Like those decisions, right? That somebody and I cannot make, it, and it has to be a developer. So, okay. so yeah. they tend to do a lot of this in like Figma. Sure. So maybe have the developer add a section on it. <laughs> Sure. I mean, that's possible. What I've seen in the past as well in these type of things is that a developer does definitely check on on the possibilities on like, okay, you want this and you want this? Great. Let me think how I'm going to build this. And I can tell you, you know, is this is good, this is bad, or this is, uh, I don't know, we don't have time for this, for example. Yes. In my so, opinion, oh, sorry. Pairing, pairing an information architect and a developer when creating this would be like a power combo. I think it would take this up to the next level. There's just no, that role doesn't exist at Toyota. It goes from like UX and design straight to the developer. So yeah. I think that would level it up, honestly. Yeah, yeah. So listening to your presentation, this sounds very waterfall-esque as far as the workflow. Yes. How would you or can you make this work within an agile environment? Sure. It definitely does. You just have to be very aware of the things that you add. So yes, in our workflow at this stage of the project, it is waterfall for sure. Once we start building, though, it's you know it can become a little bit more agile. There's there's this thing. So for example, um, this this is a proof, right? Um, you can edit the build spec. This has a status in progress, awaiting approval. Um, so when it's in progress. Anything can be done to it, anything can be added, um, anything can happen to it. When it's awaiting approval, if I go and save this, and know that I can only do this because I'm logged in as the admin, I think. Uh, but when it's awaiting approval, um, everything gets locked down, because technically, that means that we just sent it to uh, the client and no changes should be made by anybody, right? So all the buttons to add new things over here are gone. I can't add anything to it, I can't edit, like the edit buttons at the content types of the paragraphs, those are gone too. This is frozen in time because this is what the client is approving, right? And then once it's approved, something funny happens. So I, I say approved, right? And uh, once again, I, I now have the edit and the add new uh, parts over here, right? I can add new things. But if I go ahead and edit something, uh, let's change whatever. Um, now when I save it, something hap funny happens um, that it now tells me why. I need to add a reason why I'm changing the component, right? I need to say like, well, the section is automatically filled in, but why, why am I changing this if this was already approved, right? So in your question of Agile, we could definitely make it in a way where some of the components are built out, and every week we, you know, we plan on what we're doing, we're building out the component, and then we're creating it. We could probably create some sort of tagging system and say like, okay, this, all of this belongs to Sprint 1, uh, this really belongs to the second sprint, and go on there. Like we build, we build it here. We plan it here. We build it. We again go back here. We plan it here, and we build it. Um, but that's not the case in Teodi. Teodi just like builds out the site completely. So, so I, I understand this is how you would handle. Say, you've got the build spec. The client signs off. You start building the site, yep. and say it's a more complicated site. Yep. Whatever it's going to be. Yep. And then you find that there is something that was already approved that isn't going to work after it's begun, after the implementation has begun, yep. how do you handle that? Is this the mechanism? Yeah, hey, this is exactly the mechanism. You edit this. In the newer version or variation that I'm doing, I'm actually tagging things with a specific code for a change order. Because what we've seen in the past is, um, you know, I don't, like if a PM goes in and says like, oh, we need to change this for whatever reason, at the end of the project, I want to know what those changes were. And so we internally have a code for each change order, right? Uh, an invoice or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I can associate, and when I'm looking at the build spec, uh, I can actually say like, oh, um, this content type here didn't exist when I initially created the build spec. 
this is part of a change order, change order ABC, right? And then at the end, I can I can go back and say like, oh, you know, we built the site in 100 hours. It was actually 90, what happened? Oh, but those 10 extra hours were because of this change order that came in and I can associate that and I can, you know, we can talk about how the project went. So that's all that is valuable information. In the new build spec system, you can actually create a change order through the system. Now that's my thought process of like saying like, oh, um, you know, this change order is, um, you know, it's going to add two fields here and it's going to create a new content type. So generate that change order. It's basically a diff, right? Of like, this is how it existed before. This is what you're getting now. And this is the cost for it and the, you know, the justification. Have the client sign off on it. And it gives it all that history and all that story stays within the build spec and the project. So you can always go back and see why things were changed and when and approved by whom over there so you would show and you show like a non tech oriented client like so we're going to make these use these paragraph types these are the taxonomies here's how we're going to reference them uh, wouldn't there aren't they just like sure great because <laughs> i think you know i i definitely see the you know this i can definitely see that <laughs> sure Especially, you know, especially in you know the government space, you're building or providing something for something a team who's not really tech oriented. They're expecting you to know. Now, I see super duper see the value internally. Yeah. Like I want my developers. I'm like, what are your what are your paragraph types? Like, what are we doing here? But I would imagine how how valuable is other than like the you know CYA covering your ass. How valuable is the <laughs> the signature from? I'm gonna steal that. Yeah. From the, <laughs> Um, yes, well that's part of where working as a team comes together, right, where the project manager needs to educate the client. And I'm just showing you guys what the PDF actually looks like. It creates a whole listing and index of everything. But apart from that, it actually it tells you, you know, oh, this is a content type. This is a type of content. Like it, it educates the, the client on what this exactly is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, to the point. Yeah, to the point. Like, Oh, paragraph, that sounds weird. Oh, it's a group content that is placed specifically within pages and can be repeated in templates. So it's part of the, the teaching process to the client is this. Now, having said all of that, yes, there will be clients that say like, yeah, sure, fine, whatever, right? I just want the website to start. Yeah, they care a lot more about yeah. the design and user experience. Yeah, exactly. But you could always go back and say, well, that's actually your fault. <laughs> um, and you signed off of this and then, you know, um, all, the, all the legal fun can, can start for that. After that, uh, yes, Chris. I can say from from the government's perspective, like my technical knowledge is okay. Like I'm sort of mid range. I don't do any of the development work myself. But having something like this would be really helpful, so that I could say, look, I need these changes to this particular part instead of me fumbling around sending screenshots to the devs right. and that kind of thing. It, I mean. It, I would say that it probably would probably put more ownership into yeah. their hands. Well, and once you're maintaining it and you're here, like over long term and just education about how to use your site, sure. and it's like, I, yeah, I yeah. I mean, that kind of documentation, it goes more right. like the content style guide. And like that. Have you had anybody who's like, give us three months to research what a paragraph type is and mm. then we'll sign off? Like, not, not three months for that, but. Definitely, and especially in the government, sometimes it's like, oh yeah, this is great. Give us a month to have this approved, right? Yeah, and yeah. So like, you're, you're stopped. But that is better than starting and then not having it approved, right? Or like, oh, we came back with a gazillion changes, right? And the developers had already started, and now what, right? Um, over here, I think you had Yeah, I was wondering, where do you actually involve the client in demos at this point? So I come from an agile sure. background. I don't see, it sounds like you have them sign off and then you say, cool, you have no input. And no, <laughs> not at so all. So like, what happens then? <laughs> sure, once they sign off, we actually start building it. And yeah, we have like, uh, I think at the beginning, there's really not a lot of exciting things to show. But I think, uh, you know, two weeks in, we can go in and say like, hey, this homepage content type now exists, and look, the fields exist, and is this what you imagined, right? Is this, uh, because now you start talking about like the whole admin experience of, of it, right? So the client's like, yeah, sure, um, this title field exists, but Jesus, um, why is it at the bottom, or why is it at the top, or is this, like, like and, and you have those conversations with the client, so even though everything is built out, you do have 
weekly or bi-weekly demos with the client to show them the progress. Do you let them change their mind or you, you hold them to that, this and that, you go that's, no? That's a great question. So this is the part where the good, strong project manager and a good tech lead can work together and say, figure out the level of effort, right? Because if you're telling me that you want the title to be second, that's something I can do in two seconds. If you're telling me that the title needs to be generated by chat, you know, some sort of a <laughs> chat GPT, and they're like, oh wait, well, that's a conversation, right? Um, and then you can play around and you can say, well, I can do this, but like this other section, let's do a phase two on it, whatever, whatever the whole process is, right? So I've seen something like really similar at like, uh, yeah, like actually been like validated against like the fields. Like Palantir had that big old spreadsheet that was like around. And I heard that Palantir was that, that generating is. stuff off of that. This is so specific that I was wondering if you guys were considering or using it at all to actually output some of like the starter config for the thing. So since it's, you know, <laughs> yeah, yes. yes. There's, there's a, there are other examples in the wild. Yes, Acquia has a Drupal <laughs> spec tool. It's a it's still a spreadsheet of sorts that has some options. And then this University of Edinburgh one, uh, it's another spreadsheet, but this was, if I'm not mistaken, created from the Palantir one that they had a very long time ago. Um, yes? I want to go back to the process. Um, if you're, I'm, this I can see works great for new websites, mm -hmm. but I'm assuming you guys win projects that have already been built and need to be maintained. So when you come in, I'm assuming more than half the time, probably you don't have any documentation. As we all know, that's just how it is, right? Yep, yep. Um, so how do you take on those projects? And what do you do? I introduce the build spec tool for those kind of projects as well. And what's the process of getting like an existing system into this? Okay. So it depends. But we have in the past grabbed an existing project and added it to the build spec for our understanding and the client's understanding of knowing what you actually have. Uh, we have a very recent example of a client that came to us and said, oh, uh, my ba my past agency bailed, but you know they assured me it was 60% done. And we're like, oh, great, right? And then we get in there and you know, the number was closer to like 20%. Um, so the only way to actually tell that to the client and have them believe us is like, okay, hey, look, here is what your website has. This is a visual representation of what your website has. Now, all right, now, now that this is done, we'll like save it in time and say like, okay, what do we actually need to build? So what is it, the new things that we need to add to it to give you this completed site that you want? But yes, uh, you know, you kind of have to figure out if the level of effort is useful for a case like that. But if it's a new, if it's a huge site, and it'll it'll serve, it'll help you as an agency to do that. It'll help you document it. Yes. This is more of a brainstorm than yeah. anything else. But I was just curious if it had occurred to you or anyone else in the room really to use uh, to like create the spec that has all the fields and everything you want your content type, and give it to AI and let it generate the YAML configuration files that you can then pull into Drupal and just generate it. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, generation. yeah. That's the next generation. Yeah, I, I haven't gone as far as that. Oh, I know sure. in, in, in the work that I'm doing, I do use Drupal's own uh, configuration mechanism to create the configuration files for these components. Obviously, for the you know low-level ones, the content types, the paragraphs, stuff like that, uh, it's really hard to spit out something even more complicated than that. But we're talking about you know how long does it take to build out a site? Just do the site building part. Is it 10 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours? So depending on the size of your site. If you invest eight hours on this, you're guaranteeing that you have a fully spec outside, uh, fully documented, that the client approved it, and that you can actually cut hours, right? You can actually make it the initial uh, site building part, uh, make it easier and faster, and then you can have the development teams come in. So, uh, sure, AI is something that probably in the next year we could yeah, take a look at. This seems like importing a file is really easy, so. Yeah. Here and then here. Uh, as an architect, this is brilliant and is lighting up my brain in ways that Thank you. hasn't been lit up in a long time. And so you threw the bucket of water on, like, <laughs> you know, oh, we're going to assess this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but very cool. Uh, kind of makes me think that they, like, if that documentation could actually live in the actual site that it's building. Like, if you're, you mentioned that you're rebuilding it, so I'm considering. 
suggesting whatever, kicking around the idea like, this ought to, instead of being node content type, ought to be its own entities. Sure. Right, so I, I recently built a content model documentation module that creates documentation or allows you to create documentation and it's its own entity so it doesn't mingle with the nodes that right. are the actual content right. of the site. And this seems like the, the other, you know, the mirror of that. Like, sure. All of that, and so instead of pressing the button that is like generate the config that I can, it actually builds it, right? Actually, and then you can also do here's the current state of the site. You know, these are the things that have already been built. Here's the stuff that hasn't been built yet. Uh, it just seems like a natural. That's a great idea. Connection. That's a great idea. You could do this as a basically a custom module that gets installed onto the site, and then that way you can continue to work on it, and every site gets a new. Iteration of this module and, and then generates that. And to the question over here, then about oh, you, you're adding this to an existing site. Yeah. Boom! Right, you've already got your version one. Yeah. Right, it's it's just it exists. It's reading the actual config of the site, giving you a report. Then you you know press whatever to revision that, and then you work from there. It's 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 brilliant. <laughs> there, there's a million of things to, to yeah. do with this. Yes, so we're, I want to clarify something. Yeah. Most of your contracts are fixed price, fixed scope contracts. Correct. For this type of work, yes, they are. So they're not an agile contract because agile contracts have to be fixed um, term. I mean, I, I mean, you give do. me a lot of money and I give you what you ask for. We do, we do, we definitely do. I, I think there's a there's a balance point that is important for every organization to figure out where there is worth. You know, for for a lot of the agile uh, contracts that we have. It's just small fixes, you know, every week, every week we do something new, every week we do. Is it worth adding this if it's simple, if it's something that we all agreed on, if it's just one developer that's working on it, so we're not going to step on each other's toes? That's something for the company to decide, right? So this is more catered to a big build where I know I'm going to have at least three or four developers working on it at the same time. For smaller incremental fixes and an agile workflow, maybe it's not the right solution, right? Yes. It is. Oh. <laughs> Do you need to, no, I have a question, but also. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. good. Uh, <laughs> I, I wondered where this fits for you uh, in like estimate related to the cost uh, in estimating process. Uh, you have a, I don't know, we really front load our estimating and then some of the detail like design happens after we do estimate and this is it's not pleasant. I just wondered where it worked. I'm not looking for you to fix that literally. How does it work into your process? Oh, that's actually a great question yeah. because I think it's a problem a lot of agencies have that I sell you a project for ten ten dollars and then designers go in and do something ma amazing and crazy, right? And when a developer comes in it's like, oh, you have five hours to do all of that. Like, oh great. Um, but that conversation is better served with a system like this where I can go back to the project manager, I can go back to whoever and say like, okay, this is why the $10 won't get me to what you want versus I just don't feel like it, right? You know, sometimes I, the, the pushback you'll receive when I say like, oh no, this is impossible under that budget. Is that your opinion? Is that just because you're slow, you know, et cetera? Um, having the documentation of saying like, yes, all right, for example, this content type has all these fields and also like the front end has all these things on it um, and I can put in the estimate of how long it'll take. Now I have a number of the hours that I have for the project and I have the hours that, I, that my developers are telling me I need to, right? And if this number is not close, then now I have a problem, but I can have that conversation at the beginning of the project, right? And that's the conversation you don't want to have at the end, where you're like, oh, we're already over budget and half of the website is missing, right? So it, it doesn't solve it, but it allows you to have better conversations for it at the beginning. For sure. So you're, you're able to put together an estimate before the design comes and before the build spike? No, ab so. no. So, so um, again, I, I feel that's a, a tricky problem that I, to my knowledge, not, you know, agencies have a hard time um, dealing with. Of, I, I give you a number before I actually design it out, right? Yeah. So um, once I actually have to do it, I need to figure out if I can actually do it for that, for that number, right? So what I'm saying is um, before development starts, having an accurate uh, estimate of how much I think it's going to take in development 
can spur that conversation and have like a better conversation with the client and say like, hey, I know what we said then, but look at how pretty it is. And <laughs> so now it's actually gonna be 20, is that okay? Or no, okay, so actually it's gonna be 10, but like we're gonna need to leave this other section to a phase two or something this week. Yeah, just building on that, we, could, we were trying to build in multiple touch points where we had these conversations, right? Where the design, UX designer would do their work, we'd do a handoff and the developers would look at it and we'd have a conversation. And that's the first opportunity we have to say like, this is amazing, but like doesn't fit in the budget. And then we do the bill spec and we have even more validation, like this doesn't fit in the budget. And so we're trying to, to force these conversations to happen as early in the project as possible by creating these touch points and these conversations. And, the, and to Rolando's point, the bill spec helps because sometimes when we have this like tangible thing, the designers and project managers believe us more sure. when they say no, sure. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's a mystery. Time. I can yeah. understand that. Yeah. Yeah. But the, uh, we've, the best solution we found to the problem you're facing is no, we can't accurately estimate estimate before designs, yeah. and we need to have the designs, have that conversation, make a build spec, and have that conversation. So it's kind of maybe, yeah. Okay. Sorry, I don't want to keep this in the no, All right, any other questions? Yes. Been doing this 35 years. Developers are finally learning what carpenters have known for thousands of years. <laughs> you got to have a blueprint. I agree. I agree. I agree. We uh, and the government doesn't believe in blueprints. Yeah. We, we kind of have to teach them at times. But yeah, no, I agree. Um, I, as a developer, have many times in the past just wanted to get started. Right? So I, oh, I design, great. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And sometimes it's better to just take a step back, plan and be better set up for success. They're also right. learning measure twice cut once. Yeah. 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 All right, so thank you everybody thank for staying. You.